Good evening. The IRA bomb on Friday has shattered the hopes of those who believe the terrorists had laid down their weapons for good. That bomb has also put Jerry Adams in the dock. The ceasefire had allowed him to don the mantle of statesman and he was treated by governments as a serious power broker in the peace process. A few hours ago, the Prime Minister said that the door remained open to him, but only if Sinn Féin and the IRA repudiate violence entirely. So how can Mr Adams now convince John Major and the rest of us that he really is a man of peace and not just an apologist for terrorism who's lost his influence over the bombers? But first, World in Action has been out in the streets of Belfast to find out what Friday's bomb has meant to the men and women of Northern Ireland. It was the most enduring image of the peace, but today the graffiti are gone and the peace has ended. Seventeen months ago, for the first time in a generation, the streets of Northern Ireland were safe to play on. Now that fragile peace has been shattered. Last Friday night, the IRA ended its ceasefire. One hour later, a massive bomb rocked the Isle of Dogs in London. Two dead. Scores injured. Hope shattered. Belfast this weekend. Our phone lines are open on Belfast 325 Floods of callers besiege a radio phone-in as a security clampdown starts on the streets. My husband came in and told me that the ceasefire had ended. Like most people, I was deeply, deeply shocked and so, so disgust at the presumption and faceless people who can at one command turn the lives of all of us upside down. I thought there was a hope for the future in Northern Ireland, but particularly for children. Little poor Marley is another enduring image of the ceasefire, but his picture is being reprinted now for all the wrong reasons. When they heard it on the news and they asked, is that the ceasefire over? Um, we just told him, well, as far as we knew what we were hearing on the news, yes, it was over. And he says it's disgraceful. We need peace for our children. It's the children's generation that we should be looking forward to. Belfast's newest members of that generation are cared for in the Mater Hospital. They should symbolise hope, but these babies were born after the ceasefire had broken down. I was born in 1967. Sure, I mean, the trouble started in 69. My mum probably said to herself, well, when she's grown up and she's got her own children, maybe this will be all over. And there was hope that it was over. Eileen was born at 28 this morning. The last 18 months in this country has been far better than it was, you know. And if it was like that for her, it would be brilliant. And I, I watched TV on Thursday night and we were talking about it, to two fellas trying to, to work things out, one from one side, one from the other, and, and then 24 hours later, there's a bomb. Those two fellas met on Ulster TV's Counterpoint programme. For the first time ever on television, the men closest to the paramilitaries agreed to discuss their differences. One is a loyalist whose father was murdered by Republican terrorists. The other, a staunch Republican who spent 43 days on hunger strike while in jail. Only 24 hours before the London bombing, their meeting carried immense significance. What we all know is we, we have all been hurt in this conflict. You know, Gary's been hurt, he lost a father. I've been hurt, I've lost family and friends. What I'm committed to do is to do everything in my part to try and ensure that we don't move back to that type of situation again. Mr McMichael, what are you, a loyalist, going to do to ensure it doesn't happen again? Well, unfortunately, it has happened. The uh, IRS bombing uh, on Friday night has tragically killed two people and injured so many others, has shattered the peace process, and it was expected, it was Jerry Adams, that he would deliver the IRA. What last Friday shows is that he has no control and that he has failed singularly to deliver the IRA on anything. But it's not just the hardliners who dismiss Jerry Adams' credentials. Other people have lost loved ones in the Troubles because of IRA atrocities and they're bitter about his role. As soon as that news flash came on, it was just like reliving what happened to me that Saturday morning. I knew straight away there was something going to happen. And when they said about a bomb going off in Canary Wharf in London, that was me. It was total, I felt numb, I felt sick. Michelle Williamson lost both her parents in the Shankill bombing. There was only one, one person to blame. And that's Adams himself and what he stands for, Sinn Féin and the IRA. Why is that? Because that's, they started the ball rolling again. They started Friday night. If that man was determined to condemn what happened Friday night and try and work for something, try and work for peace, Everybody get together 
it might make a new man of him. But he, he won't do it. Because I think he's ashamed or he has something to hide. Mr. Adams, the shock of Friday continues. What do you say to that woman and thousands like her? Well, I think as Pat McEwen pointed out earlier, that all sections of people here have suffered as a result of the conflict. And it's quite proper and indeed very predictable that the victims or the families of the victims should speak in the way that she has just spoken. My sympathy is with all sections of our people who have suffered in the last 25 years. I, like others, worked manfully to put this behind us. Myself and Mr. Hume and Mr. Reynolds and people in Irish America gave the British Prime Minister a peace process on a plate. We persuaded the IRA to stop. The Loyalists then followed that example. The British Prime Minister gave a very clear commitment privately to Sinn Féin, to John Hume, and also publicly to the Irish Taoiseach, Mr. Reynolds, that substantive talks would begin three months after the IRA ceased. Here we are 18 months later, and there hasn't even been one word of substantive negotiations in all of that time. And a bomb has gone off. What do you say, if anything, directly to those who are the relatives of the people who died in London as a result of that IRA bomb and to those who were injured in that bomb? Do you, on behalf of republicanism, say, I'm sorry? Well, I have made it very, very clear, not just now and not just in the wake of atrocities, but sometimes in very painful situations with people who have suffered at the hands of the British or of the Loyalists that Republicans are sorry, that I do regret what happened. That even, even, excuse me, even before I was aware that anyone was injured, much less killed, I was saddened by what had happened. Now, we had for 18 months no war, but we had no peace. And what's required for peace is dialogue. And I listened to Prime Minister Mr. Major doing what I consider to be a damage limitation job. I can see that it looks to me that there's a gap between... British politicians, the British establishment, and the people on this island. There's a gap about what the last 18 months offered. The last 18 months offered the possibility, in an unprecedented way, for all of us to come together to ship out an agreement and an accommodation. I'll come to what the Prime Minister said in the House of Commons shortly. I want to stick for a moment on what you described just now as an atrocity. You accept it was an atrocity. Well, I have, I have spelt out in some detail Sinn Féin's attitude and Sinn Féin's sympathy with those yeah, do who were you, killed. I know that, and I'm asking you, do you accept that it was, well, in I, your words, I, an atrocity? Excuse me, I have made my position clear. So I you don't use the word atrocity well, of, well, that is of that bomb? You don't use the word atrocity? Well, first of all, I'm not going to differentiate between any incident in which people are killed or injured. I've never sought to condone or to justify, especially those incidents where even inadvertently civilians have been killed or injured by IRA bombs. Now, we can spend the rest of this programme doing what British presenters are very good at doing, engaging in the politics of the last atrocity. And, you can, do, and you can do, and if I may say so, Mr Adams, with respect, you can do what the Prime Minister said you have done all the way through in the House of Commons this afternoon. You can continue ducking and weaving well, when these thoughts are put to you. Well, I am not ducking and weaving. I have, no, let me finish, please. I have put my position very clearly. The party which I represent is committed to peace, is committed to democratic dialogue, to democratic agreed uh, outcomes of dialogue, and to a negotiated settlement. Now, I could say all of the things that you have just said to the British Prime Minister. We have waited a long time to hear apologies or expressions of regret from British Prime Ministers for the atrocities committed by, by their army in my country. We're all, even in terms of this discussion, slipping back into the old agenda. Let's discuss so that we can learn from the last 18 months what didn't happen you so, that this peace okay. process, so that this peace process can be resurrected and so that we can try to build the accommodation and agreement that all of us want. I, 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 I put this to you. You say they haven't apologised, the British government. I put to you that in I the don't wake... I think it's uh, important, on, by the way, me, that now, they now haven't apologised. I think what's important is that we talk across the table, now let that me, we talk let about how to get an agreement mm, and, a, and a negotiated settlement. Let me suggest to you that a great many British people watching, 
here in Northern Ireland and on the mainland and many people beyond who may be watching this program will say his failure to condemn this atrocity is in practice to condone it. Well, you see, you're not listening to what I said. And can I just, to get it geographically correct, I live on the mainland. Ireland is its own mainland. Leaving that aside, I have said that I have never sought to condone or to justify IRA operations in which civilians are killed. Now, having said that, there have been over 3,000 people killed. Before the IRA cessation, 14 members of my party were killed some by the British Army. All of that is in the past. Okay. All I of that had the possibility of forever being put in the past. Let's look at how, No, let me finish, please. How, how could that have happened? In the same way that South Africa worked out its future. In the same way as people in the Middle East were in many ways given an incentive by breakdowns. Not this retreat that we see by John Major back into the old safe positions. I don't even know John Major's mind in any of these things because in 18 months John Major could not bring it upon himself to talk to any member of Sinn Féin. Well, you've had a chance to talk to his senior ministers, but we'll come to that in just a moment. And I imagine that he speaks to his senior ministers and must know your views. Let me, let me suggest to you that uh, your failure to condemn, which you've explained, and I don't pursue that any further, which you don't condemn for the reasons you've given, has potentially some meaning if your relationship with the IRA is one that gives you some influence over the IRA. Let me ask you this. Are you and the IRA still partners today? Well, first of all, let me say that I resist the temptation to engage in the politics of selective condemnation. That's what you're asking me to do. That's what John Major, let me finish. Please. I said that you've given your reasons no, quite clearly to have my question to you. Is, are you still partners? You've made it very clear why you rejected it. I gave you answer. plenty of time yes. to say I, it. I have tried not to interrupt your questions. Okay. I refuse to engage in the rit ritualistic soundbite of selective condemnation. Now, what I say and how I say it and how I formulate it is a matter for me. One of my objectives, because obviously people are emotionally and in a human sense and intellectually repulsed by many of the things that happen around us. But what I say has to have the effect in a measured way of trying to make sense out of what has happened, of trying to win confidence of people who have no confidence in what was built in the last 18 months. Now there you talk about okay. influence. Excuse me, let me finish. No, well, I'm going to interrupt you now, I'm afraid, because you've, okay. made, you've made your point for very, very fully and very well in your own terms. Let me uh, suggest to you that it's not only the British people, it's the British government and it's the Irish government and indeed it's the nationalist community in general who want to know the character now of your relationship with the IRA. Are you still partners? Well, first of all, we have never been partners with the IRA. I have never sought in long years of involvement in Republican activity to in any way make the IRA the pariahs of this situation. Can you talk to them? Well, I haven't talked to them yet. You haven't talked to the IRA yet? No, and I'll tell you why. i tell you why. Because my purpose has to be to try and resurrect, to rebuild, and to get the peace process back upon the rails. If you, did, if you wanted to speak to them, could you speak to them? Well, Would they I, talk to you? I could you lift well. up the phone and say, I'd like to talk to whoever it is? Now, let's, let's not be absurd about it's, all it's of It's absolutely this. central. Okay, are you going to let me finish? Absolutely. To that okay. question, I'd be delighted to hear an answer. Okay. Myself and Martin McGuinness, after lengthy, years-long discussions with John Hume, during which he and we were vilified, during which both our parties were made victims of both British and Loyalist terrorism, put together a package, along with Mr Reynolds, and we went to the IRA and we persuaded the IRA. The IRA showed itself open to persuasion, not because I was able to exert some disproportionate influence over them, or anyone else for that matter, but because they wanted to sue for peace. Now, they took a decision. The decision was to go for a negotiated settlement. They thought that the terms for that negotiated settlement would, in the words of the British Prime Minister, have allowed for substantive talks three months after they ceased. They could have decided not to go for that, and then we wouldn't have had the opportunity of the last 18 months, because there are two ways to end wars. One is for one side to defeat the other, 
and the other one is for people to come together and to agree a settlement. Now, what the British did was to, to continue with a war policy through the peace process, to try and inflict defeats, to outmaneuver, to outflank, to divide, and so on. And at no point, at no point in the last 18 months did John Major show any uh, potential, especially, I would say, from about a year ago, to actually move this forward. Indeed, John Major betrayed the peace process and betrayed the people of Britain as well as the people of Ireland. I want to ask on this question of our relationship with the IRA because that is what you've just said is a, a view that you hold and as you know others hold very different views and we could come to that but let me on this... Well let's it, discuss it, it. let's on. discuss it, let's well, find let, out... Let me, let me conduct well, the let's find out, let, let let's find out why the Unionist didn't even have one sentence of real discussion with Mr Hume or uh, Mr. Bruton. Let's, di let's discuss why every hurdle placed before Sinn Féin was cleared by Sinn let's Féin discuss and why the peace process was stretched like a piece of elastic. Now, let's, let's discuss Let's that. discuss where we are as a result of the fact that the IRA stopped the ceasefire by killing people in London. And let me ask you this. You said you haven't talked to the IRA. Are you asking the British people to believe that you had no idea in advance that the IRA was going to abrogate that ceasefire because you hadn't had conversations with them? I have told you that in many instances, and I think we did this in the last interview, that the peace process was under continual pressure, but I had no advance notice that it was going to break last Friday. Can I go further in this? I sat with, uh, with Patrick Mayhew a year ago, and I said to him, you're doing this wrong. You need to build confidence. You need to start getting people to agree on small things. You need to move forward on prisoners, not backwards. You need to start building to bridge the gap of distrust, which essentially lies at the heart of this conflict now. And all of that, I warned privately as well as publicly that this was a dangerous venture and the British were adopting a high-risk strategy. Now, the responsibility for the bomb on Friday night clearly lies with the IRA. There's no doubt They are all. to blame for there, that. There, I have, look, come here. I have give you my clear view. It is their responsibility. The responsibility for the breakdown of the peace process lies with John Major's refusal to play a leadership role and to honour his commitments and with the unionists who refuse to deal with people on the level of human beings. Now, in the aftermath of that bomb and the wave of revulsion, anger and fear that that has caused among many people on all sides of the community here and in Britain. The Prime Minister this afternoon in the House of Commons carefully left open the door to talking to you, but only if you and the IRA express an unequivocal commitment to the giving up the bullet, the restoration of the cease fire, an unequivocal commitment. You say, I don't talk to the IRA. Is that a commitment that can be delivered? Well, first of all, let me say this. I represent a party which has an electoral mandate. I represent a party which has a peace strategy. I represent a party whose main function is to build upon that peace strategy until we have a peace settlement. It's my main function and it has indeed been my major and only priority for as long as I can remember. That's who I represent, and that's what I can deliver. The, now, when John Major, let me finish, please. When John Major says that he's not even going to talk to us unless an organization over which we have no control ceases its activities, then he's back to the old agenda, and he's a British prime minister who is going nowhere. But this is, you say it's going nowhere. I suggest that you're the person who's in real trouble because it's not just John Major who's saying we will not talk to Gerry Adams unless it is also the Irish Prime Minister well, who's saying it. You are excluded at the moment unless you can deliver, unless you can deliver your own unequivocal repudiation of the use of weapons forever. Well, and the IRA's absolute delivery of a ceasefire. Okay, you see the difference between myself and John Major is that I, in terms of my personal involvement, am um, irrelevant. I don't mind. I'm not hanging on to personal power. I'm not concerned with the petty, the petty machinations of party politics. 
Now, the Irish government, as I've said before, are wrong. The Irish government uh, clearly even give the British this opportunity to... But look, to, sorry, no, let the me Irish finish. government, the Irish government has been speaking openly to you. You've shaken hands. You've been at press conferences with John Bruton. He is now saying, having, having thought carefully about this well, after the bomb, I will only talk to Gerry Adams at ministerial level if he gets the IRA to well, stop the well, killing. Well, now, he's not, he, he, he is a serious politician, course, as is the Prime Minister, yes. and they're saying, you've got to deliver or and you're I, not relevant. And I also am a serious politician. And I can tell you this. Up until August 1994, the politics of exclusion, of censorship, of marginalization didn't work. And people, serious politicians, took risks. And out of that came the opportunity of the last 18 months. And from the, the risk that the British government and the Irish what government took risk came upon. Earth? What risk did John Major oh. take? They took troops off the street. They allowed you to speak in programs like and, this. And you they, think they, they lifted the ban on broadcasting. They did a number of things which were absolutely critical to That's building confidence. It's a very confidence. short list you have given, Jonathan. And the IRA, Jonathan, endorsed by you, and if I put this to you, the IRA, endorsed by you, have been unable to offer one confidence-boosting measure in the form of saying one weapon can go in advance Jonathan, and then we can talk. Jonathan, let me say this. Even if the IRA had been persuaded to take up the diversion of a symbolic decommissioning of weapons, it would not have stopped them doing what they did on Friday night. Because what made them do what they did on Friday night was the fact that they were given commitments 18 months ago that there would be an alternative way forward. And that alternative way did not emerge because the British Prime Minister refused to deal with it with the type of courage that has worked in the Middle East, which is working in South Africa. And all of this, all of this rhetoric that we hear from these uh, politicians who, who have no real interest. Now, we're only going to go so. forward from here. We're only going to go forward from here, clearly, according to the two governments who have the decisive voice in this, if there is a ceasefire. If there is a pause now, how do you and the IRA convince governments and people that this ceasefire is for real and not one that will be repudiated well, well, when the IRA doesn't get what it wants? Well, first of all, as you may well know, there no longer is a ceasefire. The IRA made that clear. Do you know whether there will be one again? No, I've already told you I haven't talked to the IRA. Do you, well, you, you, no, you know why they did it. Do you believe there will be a ceasefire finish, again? Let me finish. There has to be an end to all armed actions. I have made that clear. Two or three years ago, when John Major had more time, I was the person who said we need to take the gun out of Irish politics. Fifteen years ago, I said this was not a military problem. It was a political problem which had been militarized by the British and which required a political solution. That remains my position. Let me finish. I will not be deflected from Sinn Féin's clear objective of building a peace settlement. But one thing is quite clear, you see, in the last 18 months. You cannot have peace in Ireland unless a British government is prepared to be a partnership to that peace process. And so far, John Major has failed that test. Now, and at the moment, and at the moment, at the moment, Mr. Adams, it is not you, too late for John not. Major to, to accept the democratic imperative, but that means that he has to play a leadership role. And meanwhile, you, as leader of Sinn Féin, cannot deliver a ceasefire, cannot guarantee that the IRA won't start bombing in a great campaign all over again, cannot deliver anything required to get the talks back on track. Well, Nothing. first of all, is that a question? That is, is that the type of tabloid response you give to what could be, well, a future which is going to be a repeat of our past? Is that the type of rhetoric we get from presenters as we face into this very when grave they situation? Face, perhaps, Mr. Excuse Mr. Me, Mr. Adams, with, with rhetoric. No, I'm in not answers, engaged in they rhetoric. Put rhetoric in questions. I have been standing at a negotiating table my dear friend, for 18 months with others on this island waiting for John Major, David Trimble and Dean Paisley to join us. Mr Adams, thank you and good night from Belfast.